Hello and welcome to today's webinar on searching genealogical journals on AmericanAncestors.org. My name is Ginevra Morse. I am the Director of Education and Online Programs at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'll be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer this webinar today for our members members and friends around the world. Giving today's presentation is database search specialist Don LeClaire and digital database coordinator Molly Rogers. Don helps manage the applications and processes that support NEHGS's online database collections. He first got involved with genealogy while in college and spent many a day in the NEHGS library tracing his ancestors through New England and New York. Don has 30 years of experience in the software industry. Don has a BA and MBA from Boston University. Molly works on our database collections, maintaining the accuracy of current databases and managing teams of volunteers to transcribe and add new collections. Originally from York, Pennsylvania, Molly studied English and French at Colby College in Maine and has a master's degree in library and information science from Simmons College. Genealogical journals contain a gold mine of information, yet they're often overlooked resources. NEHGS has made several important journals, including the Register, the Mayflower Descendant, the American Genealogist, and many others available as searchable databases on our website, AmericanAncestors.org. Don will first provide an overview of those journals, what kind of information you're likely to find, how they can be incorporated into your research, and what journals we have on our website. Molly will then demonstrate how to navigate and search these resources on AmericanAncestors.org. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to write a question in the panel to the right of your screen. Our presenters will answer as many as they can in the time provided. There is no handout for today's presentation, but you can click on the icon of a camera in the upper right hand of your screen to take screen captures. If you don't see that icon, um, it may be because your window is full screen. If you size it down, you should be able to see that icon. We're also recording this event, and starting tomorrow, you can easily go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Don. Thank you, Ginevra. I'm really happy to have the opportunity today to talk to you about our online journal resources and how they can help you with your family resources. Research, excuse me. So the New England Historic Genealogical Society has a long-standing commitment to scholarship since our founding back in 1845. Uh, this takes the form of scholarly journals such as the Register, as well as American Ancestors Magazine, and most recently the Mayflower Descendant, which came under the stewardship back in August of 2015. In addition to those journals, we're also the premier private publishers of family histories through the Newbury Street Press. And finally, we publish how-to guides such as the Portable Genealogist, Genealogist Handbook for Iris Research, uh, Researching Your African American Ancestors, and other research guides to help you with your family research. But our presentation today is focused on journals and how to use them as an important part of your research efforts. So we can start off with a definition of what a scholarly journal is. They provide excellent resources for genealogical and historical information. They typically include expert advice on research techniques as part of what comes with them. So this combination is really valuable for anyone doing family research, no matter what your skill level and experience are. The articles in these journals are written by genealogical professionals, but they're also written by family researchers just like you and I. What makes them particularly valuable is that the articles have been vetted and they're supported by citations and sources and reviewed before they're released and made available to you uh, either in print or online. So speaking personally, I've been an amateur family researcher for most of my life and I learn new things all the time through resources such as these very journals. The bottom line is you can have a much higher level of confidence in the results you find when you take advantage of the information that's in these journals. So why use our journals? I mean, there's a, just an awful lot of scholarship that's been done already and published. So if you're trying to trace your family history, um, this can be just an invaluable aid and in be able to get deep information about your family, being able to trace your ancestors uh, 
often multiple generations in one stop or one article are available to you, or maybe just help you uh, find a concrete answer to some kind of a vexing uh, brick wall you've been facing in your research. So we have today over 315,000 pages of journals available for you online. And from those pages, we've got index entries for over 5 million names. So these things are all available in one place online, all of that information, and we'll talk a little bit more about how you can take advantage of this and how it can help you to find other resources for your research. But to provide a little bit of perspective in terms of the scope of online databases we have, now this is what Molly and I, our primary focus is to bring you as much quality genealogical information as possible to help you with your family research. So to put it in perspective, today we have 465 databases available online. Now we, we manage those or separate those by categories. So in this chart we can talk, so you can see the largest category of these records is vital records, a uh, significant amount of census, tax, and voter uh, collections. But here we have journals and periodicals. So we have today uh, over 7% of our total number of collections are indeed these scholarly journals. So this is an important investment that can make a difference for you. It's also something that's really not available in other locations. So if you look at FamilySearch or Ancestry.com, they both have perhaps a newspaper and periodical information, but they really don't have these kinds of published genealogical sources that you can use to improve your research. So it seems like we're always focused on finding new records to build out our family trees, in which case we'd be inclined to jump right in and go to the advanced search page to go see how it works. But I think to provide a little bit better perspective on the scope of what we have to offer, I'd like to start off with how you go about browsing through the journals. So this may be a path you haven't tried before on the website, and if you haven't, I would recommend it. So you see here on the home page, you can under the browse, we have a browse database indication there. So you can start there. And then when you click, that will take you into a list of all of the online databases that we currently have available. Now, as I mentioned before, there's 465 databases, so it's probably a little bit too much to absorb all at once by just browsing through those. So we have a variety of filters you can use to help you to uh, search for specific databases or certain topic areas that you'd like to get information in. So if you notice, we have at the top the ability to search by, uh, search by name. Uh, we also have an indication on categories of databases, but it, sometimes we forget to page down. <laughs> so if you, uh, if you scroll down the page a little bit further, then you can see that we have some other ways to select, and one of those is the categories. So here we have highlighted the different categories of databases that we have, and the count of databases are there. So here you can see we have journals and periodicals right there on the left. So that's directly relevant to our discussion today. So if I select that, then when the screen comes back, I'll be able to see the list of just our journals and periodicals. And then the... Um, the presentation we have here is the list of journals and periodicals. There's some icons here uh, to the left of each one of those entries that are probably worth explaining if you haven't been look, used to using them before. The magnifying glass is to let you go directly into advanced search for that specific database. So if I click on the magnifying glass at American Ancestors Journal, then I would go into the advanced search page with that database selected so I could put in my other criteria and commence searching. The second item, the I in the circle, is about information about that database or the description of that database. If you click on that, that will take you into a page to give you uh, more detailed information about this particular database, what's in it in the case of a journal, you know, when was it published, what years is it available, that sort of information. The third icon or the little camera is information about does this database have images with it. So most of our journals have images. Now this category is journals and periodicals, meaning things like newspapers. So you can see in cases of things like uh, marriage and death notices here uh, from newspapers, these are index only collections. We don't have the pages of those collections, so we just have the, the indication that it's a transcript, not an actual image of the database. But as I said, for the journals, you'll find that we have um, images for them. And the last piece here is uh, uh, a favorites setting. So as long as you've signed into the, the um, 
search page that or you're signed on to the website in general, then you have the ability to select some of these things as a favorite of yours. So you can you can check as many or uncheck as many as you want, and then you can come back and if you look over here on the left, you can get a list of databases to, that just includes your favorites. So if there's something you go back to all of the time, you can flag those as a favorite, come back to the browse page, and then be able to launch off into the, that um, resource just based on it being a favorite. The other thing I think is worth mentioning on this page is the indication of only free databases. So for our guest members, uh, if you're or if you're not logged into the system, then if you want to be able to just see what information is freely available to anyone, whether they're a full member or not, you can select free databases, and then you'd be able to restrict your searching or your browsing to the things that you have uh, direct access to. So, if we go on and start looking at American Ancestors specific journals, let's take a look at American Ancestors magazine. So, uh, I think many of the people on the call today are uh, members of the society, but if you haven't been reading your, your American Ancestors magazine, it has a range of information, including sources and research strategies to help you uh, find information and help you with your family research. There's also interesting historical accounts that may provide us examples of specific events or research case studies, things like that to help uh, provide some perspective on either areas, eras of time or your specific ancestors. So if we want to look into um, a sample here, Let's, we would click into and I would browse into the American Ancestors magazine. So here I picked a recent uh, example from the fall of 2015, and you'll notice that we have here at the top of the page an indication of what is the volume number we're looking at, and that is a pull down, so I can change to, from one volume to any other volume that I want. And then I have a page number, so it's showing me the page I'm on, but if I want to go change pages, I can just type a value into the page number, press enter, and I'll go to that page of that volume. So, but if we look at this as an example of what's available to you in American Ancestors magazine, you can see here we have an interesting article called The Long Shadow of Doubt, Pirates and Captives in Atlantic History. So if you have an interest in, in pirates, maybe you have an ancestor who was a pirate or a victim of a pirate, maybe that's something that uh, would be of particular interest to you other than uh, just being uh, curious about that era of our history. And you have other uh, general columns, and you have, you notice here's the general column on Focus of New York, uh, certainly. Um, I've been spoiled by my the convenience of searching my Massachusetts ancestors, but my 18th century New York ancestors are a little harder to track down. So some of these kinds of things can be useful. So as I said, if we wanted to go take a look at one of the articles, I can put in the page number and press enter. And that will take me over then to that article. Now here, and the, the example of the pirate story I have uh, at the end of that article, this section here uh, is included, which is, you have an interesting article about uh, that era of pirates, what was going on, but here you have resources that are available to help you do research on your own. So uh, if you're interested in where information might be found to see if you have any uh, intersection with your family history and pirates, talks about various uh, sorts of places you can look, including things like trial records, religious sermons, that. So it's a nice combination of having historic, historical information with practical and useful tips and how you can take advantage of it to do research on your own. And then if I click forward, I mentioned the, the research in New York being more challenging. So here in this uh, particular uh, issue of the magazine, we have a, disc uh, a presentation from uh, uh, Melden Wolfgang, who was, uh, uh, worked at the New York archives and talking about uh, something maybe most of us haven't looked at before, which is taking advantage of things like coroner records to do research about uh, family and history in New York. So like many, there's a, a case study involved in this, but that gives you interesting, useful tips that might be uh, really useful in getting a new perspective on some of your own research challenges. So let's take a then look at, look at the New England Historic and Genealogical Register itself. That's our founding publication. Uh, we started publishing that quarterly in 1847. Uh, we just published the 2016 editions to our online collection of databases, so it's current up through the end of 2016. It really provides a tremendous amount of information to help you with your search. I think it's, it's an also an excellent place to go look for tricky kinds of problems, like sorting out um, people that have been confused 
used uh, in the past where there's conflicts between different resources, you can use this to help get a lot of those things uh, resolved. And you also have articles that will present you know, multiple generations of a family in, in a single treatment. So if we click through oops, to the register and we can take a look at ex a page that I uh, selected for this discussion today. So here's a, a table of contents from the issue in January of 1910. I'm just using this as an example of the kind of content that you can find in the register. As with the previous example, we have the volume numbers available in the heading. Um, you can enter the page number to skip directly to some article that you would like to read more about. So you have um, articles of different sorts. Not everything is a family history. Here you see uh, an article on immigrants from England, which provides you a lot of information on what ships arrived when and names of people that were on those ships, uh, abstracts of records uh, from uh, Bristol probate. And then we have, here we have an example of uh, a family genealogy, in this case, the Woods family of Groton, Massachusetts. So if I go and select page 34 on the register, for that particular volume, that will take me into uh, an article on this family, and here I browse down. So if I have a personal interest in Captain Solomon Woods, I have the information here. Uh, we can see his name. We have information about his birth date, death date, his military service, uh, marriages, children, and you can see, of course, that we have information from this particular article. It takes it back three generations of Woods. Uh, so you can get a, a connection from one of your ancestors into this. This is an excellent way to build out your family tree and find more information. As I said, these things are researched and uh, vetted, so it's very convenient and in many ways much faster than trying to build this from scratch by going through vital records. So, if we, for example, if you look on the next page, we'll see that the Massachusetts Vital Records, which is one of our most popular online databases, but it is a vital records collection. And I go in and look in under Groton, and sure enough, I can find here is the, entrant, the entry for the death record of Captain Solomon Woods. Um, this one's kind of interesting in that we have the fact that he was, how he was killed rather than just the death date, he had a tree fall on him. Um, but you have this information, yes, it's an excellent fact, but it would take quite a bit of effort to build up the kind of information that we just saw in the journal article uh, by going through the individual vital records to assemble the details about uh, uh, Solomon Woods and his immediate family. So we talked about those citations. Now, typically, uh, the citations are included in the article. So here's another article. Uh, this one, I think, uh, from a different journal, much more recent one. And, um, and, but talks about here uh, resolving one of these kinds of tricky problems where you have conflicts between two resources. So here, the, the entry or the starting point of this article is talking about resolving conflicts between uh, two different uh, previously published stories about this particular family uh, around Isaac Johnson and his parents. And you have indiv individual facts that are footnoted, including, um, for example, we have things about um, his death. We have the little footnote indication here, and then further down there are a number of other footnotes as well. So it, it, it normally these are done at the end of the article. Uh, you would then go and you'd see the, the notes about that person. So if I go in and look at those footnotes, at footnote number one, I can see here actually, so where did the information come from? You have a reference to a specific issue of the American Genealogist, which we also happen to, or several issues of the American Genealogist, which we also have available to you online. Um, you see think references to published genealogies, um, num numerous references to Middletown, Connecticut vital records and land records. But these can be useful not only for uh, understanding how the story was put together or how the article was put together, but if you do use the approach in your research of looking for um, other family members that may have lived nearby, taking advantage of these articles, looking at the documented resources and uh, materials that come with it can be a really useful way to go out and find information about other members of your family, even if they're not specifically mentioned in this article. So, if we then look to the Mayflower descendant, uh, as I said, this is the uh, taken over the publication of that. The, um, the Historic Genealogy Society is now helping to publish this for the Mayflower Society. Um, the 
journal itself has been published since 1899. There have been a few gaps over the years in that publication, and we currently have it available to you through the year 2010. So, as you might expect, it's a tremendous source of information about the Mayflower descendants, um, but it certainly includes record abstracts uh, and other information for other colonial families that extend beyond the Mayflower descendants themselves. So if we look a little further at the Mayflower descendant, um, I mentioned at the beginning that you have that ability to get information about the database. So for any one of our databases, whether it's a journal or not, you click, click on the information or that is about this database and you get this sort of information. So you get a description of what the database is, um, we tell you, it gives you some general information pointing out that it's not limited to people with Mayflower lineage. Um, the kinds of things that includes journal, uh, transcriptions of deeds and vital records. Um, you'll notice here that the journal was not published uh, in 1936 or between uh, 1938 and 84. So when there are those kinds of gaps, you have this information here. So if you were browsing through the um, set of volumes that are available, rather than wonder if there's <coughs> Uh, issues or, or years that are missing, you can look at the information about this source and find out when it was published and understand that the things we have are really a complete set of what's available to you. And of course, uh, this and many other journals are available in printed form here at the library and will have information uh, oftentimes in terms of where you would go to find that journal. So with that kind of a background, then you can, we can go look at an example of the Mayflower descendant. <laughs> So here we have a sample volume from 2001. Uh, I think there's an interesting uh, title article here, Too Many David Webbs, which we'll come back to in a moment. But it's an example of uh, one of those little problems or brick walls you might run into that to help you get resolved. You also have things like uh, transcriptions of church records uh, mentioned here where we take in a particular church and, and be able to look at records that extend beyond necessarily specifically Mayflower descendants. So if we look forward to this particular article on too many David Webbs, I think this was a, an interesting story in that we're talking about there were two David Webbs. Both of those Davids were the sons of a David Webb, and then they lived essentially in the same town at the same time. Um, Sorting that kind of a thing out on your own can be a challenging endeavor. So articles like this can be an invaluable tool uh, for doing research. Now, in this particular case, one of the reasons why it's of interest in the Mayflower descendant is because only one of those two David Woods is actually a Mayflower descendant and happens to be a descendant of John Alden who came on the Mayflower. But whether you were on the, the Alden side or not, uh, this can be certainly a really useful tip to help you track down uh, your personal family history going forward. And then um, the other example I mentioned that they, they will publish uh, abstracts of various sorts of records. This other article from that very same uh, issue talks about the records of the Second Church of Christ in Marshfield, Massachusetts. So here they've, the, the original records were lost, but they were able to uh, find some notebooks and do a transcription and then essentially validate and provide the information from all the residents uh, in that area of Marshfield for anybody, whether they came on the Mayflower or not. So, so that kind of colonial focus that comes with the Mayflower Society can be uh, a useful thing no matter uh, what family set you're doing research for in those colon that colonial era. So let me spend a couple of minutes on just one more journal. Um, we have a number of these, but I think the Essex Antiquarian is kind of a fun uh, content. The Essex Antiquarian ran from 1897 through 1909. As noted on this title page, it was an illustrated magazine devoted to uh, biography, uh, genealogy, but also history and antiques of Essex County, Massachusetts. So it's a journal that has a very specific focus in terms of a location, but it does include information on a variety of topics, not strictly those uh, related to genealogy. So if we look at uh, this example from 1897, there happens to be an article in there about the commercial history of Salem. If you're not familiar with Massachusetts, Salem is uh, uh, on the north coast of Massachusetts or the north northern side of Massachusetts on the coast and was an active uh, um, fishing and uh, sea 
report for many years, but here's this article from 1897, which happens to include an actually an old photograph of one of the last old sailing ships, uh, the freighters that were working in that area. So kind of nice to see uh, these kind of old pictures of that area here in case in the area of northern Massachusetts. Another example from the very same issue is a map, uh, which is interesting in a couple of dimensions. It's a map of old Norfolk County, Massachusetts. Um, if you happen to know the area at all, you'll see it's kind of interesting because it's it's Norfolk County, Massachusetts, but all of the towns essentially north of this line are currently part of the state of New Hampshire. So a reminder of how the boundaries changed in the early years in New England. Um, the southern part of these towns are now part of Essex County in Massachusetts. So around 1769, when New Hampshire organized its own counties, uh, essentially old Norfolk County ceased to exist. Um, but if you're doing research and looking at Norfolk County, you will find that there is actually, like, apparently a new Norfolk County, uh, so to speak, and that there's a Norfolk County in Massachusetts in a different part of the state, uh, south and west of Boston, and so it's unrelated to this county completely, an area, uh, area that I happen to live in. So it, it was founded in 1793, so I guess that would be the new Norfolk County, but depending on your perspective, not all that new. And then last, uh, in terms of sort of the historical view, the, one of the articles in this is uh, about the importance in a agrarian society of fences. So it talks about uh, the maintenance of fences, the kind of fences people built. You can see here and back in 1685, the general court, which is the state legislature or, um, or the, the legislature passed laws about who's responsible for damages and maintenance of fences if there's been damage to them. And then you see actually that there was a, uh, a mandate that the towns have a, a, uh, a position in the town that is the fence viewer. So somebody is actually chartered with making sure that uh, all of the neighbors and residents were maintaining their fences appropriately to uh, avoid those kinds of problems where animals or other things uh, meandered into somebody's uh, property and caused damage. So I hope that uh, the time we've taken here and browsing through our journals has given you a little bit of a perspective on the kinds of uh, interesting databases we have. I'd like to turn it over to Molly to talk about how you can more directly search what's in them. Good afternoon. Um, as Don just said, he gave a really helpful in-depth look at our journals. And I'm just going to briefly summarize all the journals that we have to offer. There are 16 in all. This is our first slide of two showing the total list. Don investigated American ancestors, the Essex antiquarian, and the Mayflower descendant from this page. In this chart, the year ranges represent the years that the journals were published, not the range of record dates found within the publications. The records column represents the number of unique records indexed in each collection. Here's the rest of the list. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time talking about the New England Historical Genealogical Register, which is our largest journal that has almost 200 years of publications and a tremendous number of searchable records. Now I'll take you through a few examples of actually searching through our journals. There are two main methods for searching in our journals, by the name of the person for whom you are looking, or by the known information about an article, such as the title or the volume and page number. We'll discuss name searches first. Whether you are doing a name search or an article search, an easy way to begin to search our databases is to search on our homepage, AmericanAncestors.org. Make sure that you are logged in so that you can view the records once you get there. Um, but on this page, use your mouse to hover over the search menu. Click on Databases in the drop-down menu that drops down. This is our advanced search page, showing all the possible fields that are indexed in our databases. Not all of these categories are indexed for all of our databases. As a group, journals and periodicals have a few typical rules for what is indexed. Most journals are only indexed by first and last name. Searching in non-indexed fields will lead to no results so as a rule, starting simple, then adding categories is the best strategy for this page. To give you a brief anatomy of the page, some of the uh, boxes such as name or years are um, boxes that you can type into in information. Others, like category, database, and record type, are drop-down menus which contain a um, 
pre-formatted set of options that you can choose from. We're going to start with an example of how not to search. I know that I have a relative named Samuel Goodley who lived in Pennsylvania and was married in 1834. I filled out the search form with all of this information. You can see that the record type uh, menu has already been filled out with marriage and I'm using the category drop down menu to choose journals and periodicals. So um, even though I know this information to be true, when I hit search, I don't get any results. And this can be pretty frustrating to people because they, they know that this exists and they don't know why they're not finding it. Um, in this case, I shouldn't have put in Pennsylvania as a location um, since locations are not indexed. The record type is probably our generic record rather than marriage and um, years refer to the year that the journal was published rather than the year of the record. So those were my main mistakes here. We're going to go try searching for Samuel Goodley again. So just to summarize, start broad, uh, use only names in the journal category, and you can sort of fill in some other things as you search and see what you get. So here we just have Samuel Goodley in the first and last name boxes, and I chose journals and periodicals in the category drop-down menu on the left. When I hit search, I see that there are 36 records that seem similar to what I typed in, and you can see that up here at the top of the page. Um, I'm going to click on the first one since I know that he's from Pennsylvania and the name is most similar to what I'm actually looking for. Once I reach the record page, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of instructions of how to navigate around this page. You might want to zoom in or scroll down so you can use the plus minus buttons over here in the upper left hand corner um, to zoom in or out or you can use whatever scrolling mechanism you have on your mouse. You can click and drag the image to move it around inside the image viewing pane. Um, so I'm really excited that right here it looks like I found my relative but I would like to look for a bit more context rather than just these names and dates on the page. So Don mentioned the About the Database uh, link up here. I'm going to click there to learn more about the Pennsylvania Genealogical Magazine. So here I have um, an explanation of what is contained in this magazine. Um, it contains transcription of, of original records, which is uh, what this marriage record is, um, maybe some published genealogies. So this is really helpful if you don't know anything about the database that you land on for giving you some context for the record in general. Um, now you can use the back button in your browser to get back to that record that we were looking at. Um, and it seems to be a marriage. You can see the page heading Dutton records of deaths and marriages. Um, but I want to be doing really good research and make sure that it definitely is a marriage. And to do this, I'm going to page backwards a little bit. These records seem to be in alphabetical order, so it's a little bit easier to guess about how many pages it will take to find a section heading or title page. So I'm going to jump back to page 78, and here I can see, if you jump back, that there is that um, heading marriages. So I've just confirmed that little fact. Um, I still don't know a lot about the original source of this record, the Dutton Book of Records. So I'm going to page back a few more pages. When I get to page 23, um, there's a little paragraph that tells you about how this record book um, was a private collection, um, and it tells you a little bit about where it's from. Um, so this kind of information can be really helpful if you are trying to find other relatives that might possibly be in this collection of records, or um, if you think that you found an error, um, maybe getting a little bit more context for the collection of records can help you evaluate whether it is an error or not. Sometimes you have to search through multiple volumes to find that um, first page of the article. So we're going to look for Rachel Knight in our journals and periodicals, and we know that she was from Charlestown, Massachusetts, 
Um, but like I said, we're not going to put that in the location. We're just going to start with Rachel Knight and see how that works. So again, we have 14 records up here, which is not that much to search through. Um, so it looks like there's a few different records that come from the article called Records of the First Church of Charlestown in Massachusetts. And if you scroll down the page a little bit, um, there is a record that comes from volume 24. And we're going to click on that one and see what we can find. So here she is at the top of the page. It looks like this is a church admission record. You can see down here this uh, heading that says admitted to full communion. Um, but if we really want to find out more about this record book and confirm that it's a church admission record, we're going to start by uh, skipping back to volume 23, page 444. That's what this information right underneath the title tells us. So to do that, I'm going to go up to the volume drop-down menu. Um, and if you can see, I've pulled it down and highlighted 23. This is going to take me to the first page of volume 23. And once I get to that first page, I can type 444 into the page number box and hit enter and that will take me to the page that I'm looking for. So here I sort of zoomed in and scrolled down and you can see that the first heading that would be above Mrs. Knight is a church record, um, church admission record. But um, again, this is not the beginning of the article so we're going to have to skip back a few more pages to try and find information about this source. So to find the beginning of an article from the middle or the end, guess a page number that's maybe two or three uh, different from the one that you're on. And once you get there, look at the article heading and you can evaluate whether you need to continue jumping uh, in the volume or if you need to move a little bit forwards to find the first page of an article. So through guesswork, I made it all the way back to page 187. This set of records is not published consecutively throughout this volume. It's in little chunks here and there. Um, but it was definitely worth trying to find page 187 because there's this charming description of the record book, a venerable volume that is brown and worn with age. Um, and it gives you a little bit of the history of this early church. So that could be really helpful if you were researching Rachel Knight and wanted to know more about um, this community that she was a part of. So. Now we're going to talk about searching for a known article rather than searching on a person's name. Um, and so I have this hypothetical example that I found someone named John Ad Abbey in Tories New England Marriages to 1700, but you could come across uh, a citation in many of our different databases. Don showed you some um, journal articles that referenced other journal articles, um, and some vital records come with references. So deciphering Tory is always an interesting challenge. Um, here it looks like he's recording the marriage of John Abbey and his second wife Hannah, whose previous names he is unsure of. She married a third husband, Jonathan Jennings, by around 1683. After this information is a series of citations. If we go up to the About the Database page, um, there is a link on the About the Database page um, which leads to a PDF which um, can explain some of the abbreviations that Tori uses um, to, uh, for his citations. So we're going to go to the P PDF and you can see that Essex Ant stands for Essex Antiquarium and um, REG stands for the New England Historical and Genealogical Register. So we'll go back to the advanced search page and try and see if we can find John Abbey in both of these publications. So the first thing that I'm going to do is choose Essex Antiquarian in the database drop-down menu. Then I'm going to go to the volume menu that appears once I've chosen that and choose volume 1. Finally, I'm going to input page 14 into the page number box and then I can hit search. So once you have these results, clicking on any of them will bring you to page 14. 
If you scroll down the page past the preview of this screenshot, you can see John Abbey's name. Um, but we'll just click on one that we can see. Um, and then once we're on page 14, you can see the information about John Abbey that Tori based his, inf his entry on. Then um, I repeated the same process for the register um, and found John Abbey in volume 7 on page 325. Again, I would want to trace this article back to the first page since right now I'm not exactly sure what brief memoirs and notices of Prince's subscribers is. Um, and this continued from page 272 can help you know how to trace that backwards. So Tori references articles by volume and page number. In some other cases, you may know the title of the article for which you are searching. American Ancestors magazine has a helpful article which outlines journal articles about New York published in publications that don't necessarily focus on that state. If we zoom in on this page, uh, we're going to choose this article at the bottom called The Puzzle of John Adams and Sarah Smith of New Jersey and see if we can use, uh, if we can find it using article title search. So here I chose the American genealogist in the database drop down menu and uh, this little checkbox appears called the article title only filter. Um, so how to use this correctly, I'm going to type the exact um, article title into the keywords box and then hit search. If you notice, this little checkbox over here only appears with um, publications that it um, are indexed that way. So um, not all of our records have articles that have article titles. Um, so if a specific database doesn't have that feature, the checkbox won't be there. Um, just a quick tip, always look at the search tips. If we go back to that same page we were just on, um, you can see that the search tips will explain what I just said about how to use this article only title filter um, right here. It notes that the year range is only for the publication years, which we've talked about a couple times, and the fact that locations are not indexed. Um, this one is particularly helpful. If you wanted to sus subscribe to this journal, you could, um, and it gives you a little bit of information about other related databases. So if we act as if we performed that search, the article title only filter will bring you to the first page of an article. So we'll click on this search result and see what we can find. And here we are at the first page of the article about John Adams and Sarah Smith, um, which looks like it has a lot of helpful information about that family. Um, I'm going to go into an example that is specific to the New England Historical and Genealogical Register only. If we go back to the advanced search page, um, we are looking for an article called Joanna Adams Lunt Identified. And I know that it's in volume 151 of the register and it starts on page 308. So we can use either the article title only filter or the volume and page number search since we know all of that information about this article. When we hit search um, and click into the search result, instead of getting the first page of the article, we receive this message. And what that means is that um, we don't always have permission from all of the authors in the register to display their work online. Um, but if you go to the next page, you can just um, email webmaster at nehgs.org um, and we'll send you the PDF of the article. So um, sometimes people get frustrated, but we're very happy to send it to you. To conclude, We've given an overview of the journal resources we have to offer through AmericanAncestors.org and we've delved into the specifics of how to search through them. Searching by name or known information is going to be your best search strategy. Keeping your search queries broad to start is going to be the best way to search. If you have any further questions, uh, please email us at webmaster at nehgs.org. We're happy to help you navigate the rich information that journals can contain. I have just one more 
uh, slide, we have a new uh, blog called Database News, um, where we're announcing in real time when we update our databases. So the Weekly Genealogist is our newsletter that we send out every week and announce a database. But um, this is supposed to give you maybe a few more search tips. It will give you a real-time update. Um, once Don or I finish updating something, we will update this blog. So if you want um, you know, the latest information about what we've been working on, you can subscribe to our blog by putting in uh, your email address in this box right here. All right. Well, thank you both Don and Molly for your presentation. So now let's tackle your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask either of the presenters, uh, please go ahead and type it in the questions panel and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time provided. I know that there are a lot of questions and we may not get to all of them today. Uh, so one question um, from Barbara who asks, uh, so when you do a search, do you have to do a search for all the different spe spelling variations of, say, a surname or first name. Um, Don, I'm wondering if you could maybe answer that. Yeah, sure, I can help with that. Um, the search technology we have uh, has some built-in capability to do what's called fuzzy searching. So typically, if the spelling is within one letter, you don't have to do anything special at all. Um, you can put in, you know, for example, if the last name is Hansen, it's equally popular to spell H-A-N-S-E-N, H-A-N-S-O-N. Uh, if you just, you could pick either one of them and you'll get results back. Um, some other things, if there's multiple uh, letters difference, then you might need to do a couple of different searches or use something like the wildcard characters where you can use, which are defined in those search tips, how to do wildcard searching. So you could put in a uh, an asterisk or a question mark to uh, allow for any multiple, vari multiple values in one position of a name. Okay, great, thank you. Um, now, Bev has a question, who does the indexing for our journals? Um, Molly, I'm wondering if you could maybe answer that. So we have a lot of volunteers who are really amazing. Um, they do great work for us, they are really passionate, and that's uh, how we get the majority of our indexing done. Wonderful. Yeah, so a lot of support from our volunteers. Um, now, another question, Winnie asks, uh, so when a person publishes something through a journal like the Register, um, does the author retain any rights to that info? Amali, I know you, you had that example um, where the author hadn't given permission. Can you just kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, I we don't post that those articles from the register that we don't have permission for, we have permission to post most of them. Um, and as a member, you are like subscribed to the register and so you get the paper copy in the mail. Um, so like I said, we're happy to send the PDF via email, which is uh, about the same as mail. Um, I don't know exactly all the specifics of all the rights that the publishers and authors retain, but the publishing department might be better able to answer that. Sure, and I should mention too that we did a webinar um, about a year ago on publishing uh, or writing a, an article and publishing through one of our um, journals or periodicals. And we do talk about uh, author copyright and that kind of thing. I know for the register, um, the author does maintain copyright, uh, but for some of our new agree uh, agreements that we're working out with the authors, um, we're including talk about different formats as well. So if we were ever to make a journal into an ebook or an e-publication, or you know having that resource on our uh, on, as a database, as a searchable database, um, that some of that information and copyright information is being included in future agreements. So lots of information there. Um, a few questions. Maybe for clarification, so for example, Karen is asking, is there any way to search for articles about towns rather than a person? Um, Molly, do you want to answer that? Yeah, um, the keywords field is a fun 
field to experiment with. Um, if you choose journals and periodicals, and we can go back to our Rachel Knight example and type in Charlestown, um, that will bring up uh, articles that have the word Charlestown in their journal title. Um, so while we don't have it indexed on location, I would definitely recommend typing any locations into that keywords field and seeing what you find. As long as it's in a journal title, um, it should be able to bring up some helpful answers. And a similar question to that, um, Jane asks, are all names in a journal article indexed? Um, yes, I think in most cases we have all the names indexed. Um, in most cases, they the indexes come from the index at the back of the journal, um, but it is possible that we may have a few journals that were treated differently from that, and I'm not exactly sure which ones they are right now. And uh, another question about indexing. So June asks, is the indexing by volunteers done online or remotely, or does it have to be done um, in person at the NEHGS Library and Archives? Uh, Molly, I'll, I'll let you answer that one as well. Um, we're really flexible with our volunteer program. We have a lot of volunteers who work remotely, um, as well as many who come in person to the library. Um, and we don't have any software. We work with Excel spreadsheets and um, JPEG image files. So we send those to our volunteers, and they send them back to us. And so we're, we're really thankful for all the work they help us with. And I should say, if you're interested in um, becoming a volunteer, uh, let us know, and we can certainly connect you with our volunteer coordinator, and she may be able to find uh, a suitable project for you. Um, now, a question for you, Don. Um, Karen asks, so what states are included or covered in databases by EDHGS? Um, if you could give some kind of general answer, that'd be great, or if there is kind of another way to see what states or countries are covered by some of our databases. Sure, thanks, Shalevra. Um, so the, the register um, covers generally New England, but also has resources from other parts around the country. I think sort of related to the earlier question about how you can do um, searches, you can take advantage of keywords to do searches. We do have a variety of these journals have some uh, specific regional flavor to them. So for example, uh, Molly was showing examples from a, a Pennsylvania journal. We have the Virginia Genealogist, which is, has a regional focus. We, I mentioned the Essex Antiquarian, which is a New England one. But we also have the American Genealogist, which is all over the country. So um, so I think that the, we don't have generally uh, strong state-specific journals, although there are some of those, and but we do try to uh, cover as broad a set of resources as possible with the ones we, we uh, make available online. Thanks, Don. And as far as our other non-journal databases, um, I th you know, is there is there a way to kind of um, see what states are re represented or any countries or anything like that, just not even our journals, but kind of um, any of our database collections. Yes, so I'm sorry. So I was answering uh, specifically from the journal perspective, but uh, many of our records, in fact, a large part of our records do have locations indexed. So if you're looking at census records or vital records or cemetery records, uh, those uh, are often, uh, if not typically, indexed with location information. So you can use that location field to put in the name of a, uh, a city, county, state, or country. Uh, I think we showed also some of the filters uh, for looking at databases. There are similar filters on your search results. So we can, uh, we can have like country level filters that are built in uh, to help you with your searching. So, so just in the case of journals, the information from the journals is really a name-based indexing, but we, do, we as much as possible, we capture location information when we're doing indexing of other um, record types. Thanks, Don. Uh, another question kind of generally about our total database collections. Uh, Stephen asks, how many names are in your total data bank? And Don, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you for this. 
Sure, thanks. Yeah, we have a, a roughly 1.3 billion uh, names that are indexed at this point. That would include um, the primary person if you're indexing, for example, a vital record or a birth record. Uh, that would include that person uh, in cases where we have the parents indexed as well. We'd be counting all of those names. So it's a pretty dramatically large number of names we have indexed across all record types. Thanks. And another question, kind of for clarification. So Teresa ask, uh, asks, does keyword search only search titles um, or does it include the text within the body of the article? And Molly, I'll let you answer that. The keyword search field um, searches this column in our database that uh, is called original text. And it varies from database to database uh, what exactly has been put into that column. Um, and so for journals, usually it is just the article title that you would be searching. Um, sometimes for vital records, it's the text of the record. So again, this is not a standardized thing. It sort of varies from database to database, which is why I sort of guess what might be found in there. Um, and for things that are fully searchable. Um, our library has a uh, digital collections, which you can find um, on that on our homepage. If you go to search, it's one of the options um, on that drop down menu. And so they have more, I think a lot of them are diaries or um, personal family histories. And those items are full text searchable, but um, most of our databases are not. And kind of another question regarding kind of doing the keyword search. Again, we talked about searching locations, um, but could you also use that to search topics or other subjects like, um, you know, divorce or a city title or um, marriages or some other kind of just general topic? And again, Molly, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, um, for journals, you're kind of guessing what might be in the journal title. So you might uh, search a family name in that category rather than in the last name field, and you might be able to find something a little bit different. I would definitely try town names. If you were interested in looking at divorce in the 1800s, um, that could be a helpful uh, word to search. So that's sort of a category that you can uh, use trial and error to kind of see if you can find what you're looking for. All right, and maybe just one more question. Um, a question from Dorothy. Uh, she says, as the Mayflower Descendant publication is typically offered on a trans, uh, subscription basis, how recent is the information available through the journal databases? Um, Don, if you don't know specifically <laughs> uh, the exact date, I wonder if you could just kind of talk about um, typically, you know, the agreements that we have with some of these journals and what how recent um, of volumes we, we typically publish online. Sure, uh, thank you. So I, have, I do happen to know, know the answer to this one. <laughs> the Mayflower Descendants Journal we have uh, from when it was first published in the late 1800s through 2010. So I would say that we don't necessarily have a standard uh, agreement. But I think the general approach is if it's we have uh, rights for ongoing publication, we do them usually at some point um, the year after the year wraps up. So for example, for the reg the New England Historic Genealogical Register, uh, we just made the 2016 uh, issues available, and we'll be going through American ancestors and others. In the case of the Mayflower Society, uh, we have a good relationship with them. Um, at this point, we have a, a fixed date of 2010, and we'll probably be looking at that uh, as we do some, have some other discussions with them about different kinds of collections and, and may be able to uh, include more recent ones. But it's a good reason to go double check that information about the database so then you can see exactly what's available uh, for any given journal. All right, well, thank you again. Um, that's all the time that we have. If you'd like more hands-on help with your research, you may want to consider scheduling a consultation with one of our experts or even hiring our research services team. Again, if you have any database questions, please feel free to email webmaster at nehgs.org. And I will include all of these emails in my follow-up, uh, all these email addresses in my follow-up email to you um, later today. 
So thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.